Nataka Nikue Mukilimo Yamaka. And people would laugh and they'd think, what do you mean a charcoal farmer? We've never heard of this. And yet, here it is, this 100 billion shilling a year industry, and the agronomics are not even well understood of dry land tree growth. As East Africa gets more affluent and people's diets are changing, although people you know, want to cook on gas and electricity, that Sunday, roast meat, or you know, that's not going to go away. And so for us, this making it sustainable is really the key sort of bit. So my name is Teddy Kinanjui. Um, I run Cookswell Gikos with my sisters. And one of our new latest products has been Seed Balls Kenya, which are palletized indigenous tree and grass seeds for broadcast and direct sowing. We get the seeds from the Kenya Forest Research Institute, KEFRI, because they're the ones mandated by law who do all the germination testing, the viability of the seeds. Uh, they in turn have seed orchards around the country, but also work with local communities to collect seed. Again, what we are selling at the end of the day is this protective charcoal coating on the seed not the seed itself. We're just making sure that if you throw that seed out and it's sitting there for three months, it's not going to get scoffed by a little squirrel on day one or a mouse on week two or whatever. Um, so through our cook stove business, making uh, all types of energy saving, barbecues, charcoal ovens, small jikos, we realized that the stove was only part of the issue with domestic household biomass energy. And we knew that we have to also put a lot of effort into growing more trees to supply a future supply of charcoal and firewood. Uh, so in the mid-1990s, we'd started doing all types of different tests on growing trees in dry land areas like Kajiado, Kitui, Narok. If people are cutting acacia tortillas in Voi, it means acacia tortillas grows there, people understand it, and has a monetary value. And so that's ideally the tree to grow more of, is what people are wanting to use. Our focus started to narrow towards indigenous trees around the year 2008, 2009, uh, from seeing how good their performance was, their resistance to drought, their resistance to insects, pests and what have you. So one thing that sort of started happening around probably 2011 or 12 is I started noticing on the side of all of the highways as you go around Kenya, I think after Kibaki they'd redone all these roads and graded them, and you started seeing all these acacia trees, so the same species of trees that we were planting on our farm were growing naturally and wild on the side of the road, to the point that the highway authority was actually paying people to cut them down and remove them. So we started doing some research on, you know, where are those trees coming from, because if these free ones are on the highway, what am I doing digging a hole and, you know, trying to plant trees? So that was a very big light bulb moment, uh, where we started really thinking about direct seeding as an alternative way of establishing and reforesting areas that have been hit hard by the charcoal trade. We partnered with a very old family friend of mine, Elson Karstad from Chardas Limited. He started the charcoal briquette business in the early 1990s in Kenya using that vendor's waste. So all the places they sell charcoal in Nairobi, as they unload it and the bags drop on the ground, a lot of the waste becomes dust and these little fines. So that piles up over the years. And he found that this was a nuisance to people. It was blowing off in the wind into their shops and stuff. And we started discussing how could we use this old charcoal dust to coat, to put a protective coating on the outside of tree seeds. As you go through the old piles of charcoal dust, some of them are deep, like six, seven feet deep, and it was almost like a way of carbon dating how old these were. We started finding these little coins in them from even 1922 is the oldest coin, the ones with the holes in them. So to us, that was a very interesting, from a philosophical stand standpoint, of, you know, a hundred years of charcoal use in Nairobi, and now this waste dust is going back to help plant a whole new tree somewhere out in the wild. Being able to do direct seeding, it substantially lowers the cost for a lot of these places. Uh, there are certain areas and certain types of trees, you know, mangoes or avocados or something, you're only going to plant from seedlings. Um, but there are other places, if you're planting hundreds or hundreds of thousands or millions of trees, seedlings become cost prohibitive. Um, and here comes the seed. And it's nice and fruit, swollen up. So now another night, two nights worth of rain. You see how it's split on the yeah. side there? Yeah. So he's getting ready to germinate. So let me put him back. And then it's back to that thing of just fingers crossed, it rains enough. And if it didn't, I only lost one, two, three, four, five, eleven shillings. Yeah. And if it doesn't rain and that big seedling dies, I lose 40 shillings. One thing with traditional tree planting is that you might have a tree that's this big 
you know, this is a foot and a half or something, are now all bundled up, A, in this plastic bag, which are banned in Kenya, and the roots have all been bundled up inside of here, and they're starting to get root bound, they're starting to go in circles around it, and just this biomass ratio of the size of the tree versus the size of the roots, it means that when you plant it, if there's a drought, or if a goat comes and eats it, it doesn't have as much energy in its storage, which is what roots are for. What happens though with seed balls and direct seeding, is you get the exact opposite. When you plant the seed ball and the tree starts germinating, is that the tree might be only one inch tall, but the roots will be three or four times the size. And so that means that tree has such a competitive advantage from being directly rooted into the ground, that if anything happens, it has that storage mechanism of more energy to come back. And the biggest thing we've done so far that was really incredible is with Senator Ledama Olekinya. He organized um, the Farmland Aviation who volunteered their airplane for free. They have one of these fertilizer crop dusters and mobilized a director from Kefri and a whole bunch of KFS people and bought a huge amount of seeds, 20 million plus seeds. And we did a, one of the first really formal aerial seeding um, proof of concept flights that's ever happened in Kenya over the south, I think southeast Mao, I believe. And it was incredible because it only took about 45 minutes to drop out, you know, a ton and a half of tree seeds. And you're thinking of those 20 million, I think from our rough calculations, we actually only need three or four percent to successfully grow to make it still that much cheaper than mobilizing the traditional seedlings. The, and especially there, they're having, I think, clashes or something, so it's difficult to even access there on foot. For a lot of the environmental aspects, especially in rural areas, it's driven by, you know, income. At the end of the day, if the environment's not paying for people's needs, then they'll resort to things like cutting them down to make charcoal, to sell firewood. But if you could make equal or more money doing seed collection, uh, especially on the scale of looking at how much an airplane can distribute per um, session, it's a huge potential for big, big jobs. Again, green collar jobs from all the way skilled people like the pilot to the scientists doing the monitoring to the hundreds and hundreds of people who could be doing seed collection. Um, so we see our business model being what I suppose they call green collar jobs in a way. Um, for us, it's providing a solution at an affordable value cost to farmers, land managers, conservationists who are interested in growing more trees. And so we've tried a lot to really partner with people who, like if you're traveling up country and you know you're going to Nakuru and you're passing that place that they chopped all the trees down, take a bag of seeds with you. And it goes from anywhere, from people doing it even from airplanes, if they're doing patrols around you know, a park or doing safaris and they know this is one area that's heavily been deforested, you can reseed it that way, all the way down to we've been working with lots of school kids and stuff, which is really fun, is shooting these slingshots with the seeds. And so you can imagine most uh, school kids, you know, you give them a shovel and ask them to dig 20 holes, suddenly it's not the most fun thing they've ever done. But you give them a slingshot and a kilo of seeds and tell them go shoot seeds everywhere on that hill or something, it really brings a different level of also fun to forestry. Because for me as a kid in my school, unfortunately, it was kind of punishment tree planting. If you've done something wrong, go weed the trees. Instead of detention, carry buckets of water up and down the hill for the tree. And you know, that at that age was a bit like, well, this isn't really nice, you know? People are really realizing the importance of what they can do to contribute to a greener future.